Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, why don't we go ahead and start the day by giving each other a nice greeting with a hug or a handshake in this place. A nice warm one. Yes. Warm handshake. It is cold in here, huh? Not a cold one. Yeah. We started off with warm. It is cold. It's turns your heat up. It was hot last week. <laughs> but you know what? It's June. It's summer. It should be warm. Supposedly somebody's going to flip a switch. We're supposed to have warm weather starting today or tomorrow. Really? 70 degrees. Not right now. Huh. That would be good. Who is that? Happy Father's Day to every father that is watching online, every father that is in this place. Uh, you, are, you are so, so vitally important and more important than, than the world likes to right now think that fathers are to the way that, that we, we hold and mold families together and, and, and our leaders and, and heads of, of, of house and and just a life in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I didn't think too much about Father's Day as I was driving in. And sometimes I, I like to just keep Father's Day in the, the back of my mind because I lost mine uh, about a decade ago. And uh, it wasn't my 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 time with my dad wasn't usually considered the most ideal but when he was when he was there none of that stuff mattered because he was my dad and so anything that he could have ever ever done or or you know that that we went through in in growing up was never more important than the bond that we had with him as my dad because through everything I knew that he loved me as his child more than he knew how to even express, and he couldn't. And I understood that as I grew older. And so, just never underestimate what's in a father's heart because the love that they have is uh, it's incredible. And uh, as we worship today, I just want to to remember. I want to remember and sing sing about my father, my father in heaven, my uh, and remember my dad here on earth too because I loved him so much. And, uh, and let's go ahead and come to our Father and worship, our Father in heaven and worship. Let's give him praise this morning for all that he does for us as he watches over all of our lives, as he loves us in a way that no other father can can. Let's come to him and worship however we feel comfortable. If we want to stand, if we want to sing, if we want to shout to the heavens, let's go ahead and just have a great time with his presence in this place. Amen. 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 Brothers, sisters, come, come on down, down to that river. 
Guaranteed you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing From the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty stains Let that river of life wash it all away If you've been searching Carrying burdens If you've been lost and looking for a home You've been drifting, something is missing You should know that you are not alone oh, Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty stains Let that river
morning. It's good to see y'all. I heard that, Jim. As we prepare to take communion, I just want to remind everybody that we practice open communion. If you are a believer and follower of Christ, we welcome you to take communion with us. Just hang on to the emblems and then we'll take it all together. I was thinking about what I wanted to share this morning and it's Father's Day. And we are here honoring our Heavenly Father and being with Him. And as soon as I can get my Bible open here, of course it doesn't want to, oh, there we go, okay. Anyway, I was thinking there's a lot of stuff to be worried about lately. I don't know if you've noticed that. I went to the grocery store yesterday and I had to get dog food. Holy moly. I got home, told the dogs, you guys got to get a job. That's all there is to it. There'll be no more. You, you got to work. And wouldn't you know, it's not going to. Okay, just a second. I want to share from you from the scripture. Another time we get kind of frustrated and worried is when we go to the gas station. That's scary. But I want to read to you what it says in Matthew chapter 6. Starting at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, these are the, this is the words of Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food in the body, more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour, to your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And this is how our Heavenly Father clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thinking back on my childhood, I never had to worry about food or clothing or any of my physical needs because my dad took care of us. He provided that. Jesus is saying our Heavenly Father is the same way, only more so. How do we know that? How did our Heavenly Father show us His love? He showed us His love in that He was willing to sacrifice His one and only Son so that we might be redeemed. That's why we do communion, is remembering Jesus' sacrifice for us, that we might be one with him and the Father. On the night before his crucifixion, he was with his disciples. They were sharing the Passover meal, and at one time, at one point, he took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, said, take eat. This is my body which is given for you.
the same manner, he took a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for the salvation of many. Take and drink. Would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Uh, using debtors. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There will be an opportunity uh, for giving tithes and offerings. Uh, one of the ushers will be at the back of the room. Uh, there are other ways to give, too, as it shows on the big screen here. Give with a cheerful heart. Give knowing that you are helping to spread the gospel. You are helping to support uh, missionaries who are spreading the gospel, telling the good news. That is the purpose of the church above all else, is to share the good news. Father God, we ask your blessing on our gifts. May they be multiplied. And we thank you, Lord, for your love, for your provision. And above all, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, as we, uh, as we come back into our time of worship, let's go ahead and dismiss the kids. There they go. Let's just, uh, let's focus in on what God wants to tell us from this time. Let's just be inviting. Let's open our hearts and our minds. Just be inviting. Make this a place that, that God is just going to fill up with his presence. You're the same God today And the same God tomorrow So help me see the victory That you already see let my faith be today What it will be tomorrow And when I see the victory You already see Oh, Jesus, I believe Glory. 
Father, that is bigger and stronger than anything in the universe, Lord. We give you praise this morning. We give you glory so that you shine in this place, that you shine in this world, God. God, is why we sing your praise. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, C4 friends and family. How I wish that I could be there with you this morning. Uh, while my wife and I were on vacation this past week, we both got ill and we came back, we tested and both tested positive for COVID. Uh, but I really wanted to be here with you this week as we're kicking off a new series that I think, well, I think it just spells out some things very well for us. We're gonna start out this week in our new series called Worthless to Worth. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Many of you in this audience today, whether you're here in this room or you're online with us, uh, are parents. And I want to ask you a question this morning that you might laugh at. How many times have you given up something for the sake of your child, for your children? There's laughter that comes immediately from some of you, right, as I ask this question. Because the list is so long of things that you've done for them. That uh, Where do you even begin? Many times, do you remember your kids telling you that, well, something just isn't fair, that if you really, really loved them, you'd cave in, you'd let them have whatever it is that they were asking for. Maybe it was a new bicycle or a video game console or going to spend the night at a friend's house for a sleepover. You're a villain if you don't give them what they want in that immediate moment. And they don't realize throughout their life all of the different things that you've given up on their behalf. Sometimes it's simple things like sleep or maybe a meal that you really wanted to enjoy to have a hot dog at one of their baseball games. Maybe you really wanted the newest version of whatever, but your child says, I need a new tablet for school. How many times have you put yourself on the back burner for the benefit of your children? Now, despite all those things, despite sleep deprivation, despite the times when your kids think it's fun to maybe start slapping you in the face as you're trying to, to rest. Maybe when those times when they just talk back to you, when they disobey you. Maybe all those different school band concerts you had to go to. Despite all of those times, we continue to love our children. Parents have this innate ability to give up so many important things in their life, in pieces of their lives for the sake of their children. In many instances, you could say you would move mountains. They'd do anything, all in the name of loving their children well. Well, that's why we hear stories about uh, adrenaline-filled mothers lifting cars so that their children could get to safety. It's why we hear stories uh, about dads who gain this supernatural sixth sense that allows them to know that their child is about to fall or so they can intervene with them before they crash to the ground. Desperate parents tend to do desperate things for the sake of their children. Well, in a story that we're going to tell this morning, we're going to learn from today, it's at the center of this kind of action. A desperate father is willing to break the social norms and shove his way to Jesus for the health and safety of his daughter. We're going to be looking in Mark chapter 5 this morning. So if you have your Bibles in your laps or you use your phone app for that, you could go there now. And while you're going to Mark 5, let's set the stage for you a little bit, the context of the story as to where they're going to be for this message and where maybe we need to be as a church. This week, we turn the corner and we talk about what restoration does for a person. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how redemption takes us from worthless to worthy. Worthless to worth. And that's exactly what we find in our scripture today in Mark chapter 5. Jesus is still relatively early in his earthly ministry, but he, that hasn't stopped him from amassing a very large crowd seemingly everywhere he goes. Because wherever he's gone, he's healed, he's taught, he, and he's already begun to build up this hatred from others brewing underneath the surface as the other religious leaders don't want anything to do with him. As a matter of fact, they want to put a stop to him, which makes what happens here so unpredictable. In Mark chapter 5, verse 21, it says this, 
When Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. Now what I want to do now is I want you to pause right there because this is an unheard of story. A synagogue leader, a religious leader coming to Jesus. We know that in scripture this only happens two other times that we know about in Jesus' life. So there are three different religious leaders who come to Jesus in peaceful and non-argumentative ways. Jesus and the Pharisees and Sadducees were almost always at odds, mainly because Jesus continually called them out for things during his ministry. And these two groups had come to a place where you could almost consider them enemies, culminating in them arresting and leading to Jesus' crucifixion. These two groups are not friends at all, but Jairus still needs to run to Jesus because he has a dramatic need. And this is what desperation leads to, folks. Desperate times call for truly desperate measures. And Jairus, this father, is a truly desperate man. It's a desperate time. He's risking his authority. He's risking his standing among the other religious leaders of the day. He's risking a lot here by simply coming to Jesus. But his daughter is more important than all of those other things. His daughter's life was worth it. In verse 24, it says, So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now, a couple of interesting things happen here in, in verse, this tiny little verse 24. The first thing that jumps out is that Jesus is in the middle of going somewhere when this occurs. Where was he going exactly? I don't know. We, we don't know, but Jesus immediately drops his plans and his obligations, in this case, to pursue redemption. Jesus is interruptible for the sake of the goodness and restoration of someone. Jesus will stop at nothing for the sake of people, for the sake of God's image bearers. He is the one uh, who pursues redemption even through the interruptions. And if we're going to be a people, if we're going to be a church, if we're going to be a group that is defined by our following of Jesus' example, we have to be able to be interrupted. Interrupted from our plans and our obligations, from whatever we want to do for the sake of our people. We have to place our wants and desires and wants and desires that Jesus has for his people. Those work together. And his want and desire is to see people made well and to be made whole in his name. But there's another thing that jumps out here from this passage. It's that Jairus' patience has to be wearing thin. As we find out, this is a literally a life and death situation where his daughter is possibly only minutes away from death. And he has waited until the last second to go to Jesus. You see, because if we know who he is, we know that he didn't want to, right? He didn't want to come to Jesus. He had to. But there's this, this crowd, and this crowd is slowing Jesus down. The crowd is pressing in and pressing in around him. And it's stunting the pace at which Jesus could be moving forward. And Jairus had to be upset, fuming, angry. Not only is he possibly ruining his career by standing up with, the other, uh, with Jesus in front of the other Pharisees and the other synagogue leaders, not only is he learning to rely on Jesus, someone who is consistently rebuking his fellow religious leaders, but now he's in this crowd of sinners that's slowing them down. Jairus' daughter is at death's door, and there is no time to waste. Jesus has got to get going. And instead, Jesus at one point stops dead in his tracks. Verse 25 and following says this. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Now, not only is this a medical issue that's causing pain and discomfort, but to make matters worse, in the Levitical purity laws, as well as other man-made amplifiers that were in existence at the time, they've caused this woman to be an outcast, an outsider. 
This woman is a complete outcast. She is a lawbreaker now because she is unclean. She is someone who does not belong. And according to the law of Moses, the law that Jairus was in charge of upholding, by the way, this woman could, should be immediately sent away from the crowd. Because of this bleeding that the woman could not control, the law stated that this woman shouldn't be able to come amongst a group of people. She should be sent away from the entire community until she is clean again. But she can't get clean. And for 12 years of her life, this has probably been her story. For 12 years, she's been away from her family, away from her community, and cast out from any semblance of a normal life. Her story is no doubt one that's full of shame, condemnation, a story full of rejection. This is a story of a woman who feels absolutely worthless. And she comes up from behind Jesus trying to stay hidden, trying to sneak her way to him. And she's desperate for a new life, knowing Jesus is the only one that can give it to her. But as her story, her life that's been filled with rejection, she fears that Jesus is going to do the same thing to her. She fears that Jesus will judge her and forsake her and send her away based off of the law. Now, I don't know if it bears saying out or not, but Jesus uh, but Jairus either had already done the rejecting or he would have done it to this woman if, it was, if he'd had an opportunity to. The new life that she wants um, it, it isn't attainable in most instances. The new life that he wants for his daughter, he would have refused for this woman. And that is an interesting concept there. It was Jairus' job to refuse this woman. But Jesus, Jesus is different. Not only does this woman experience the healing, the new life, the, the transformation and restoration that's found in Jesus, not only is she given life that's now free from rejection, a new life free from condemnation, a new life free from isolation, she gets to experience the face, the glory, the full love of God found in Jesus. Verse 30 says that once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, just as the bleeding woman forced her way to Jesus, Jesus forced his way into finding her. Why? Was it so that he could find her and, and cast her away? To shun her or to condemn her? No. No, not Jesus. Because Jesus pursues redemption. It's one thing to be healed. It's another thing to come face to face with the glory and love of Jesus. To experience the fullness of God. Verse 32 says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering." This is just an amazing story of Jesus pursuing redemption. But one person's redemption comes at another person's tragedy in this case. Jairus is still waiting here and waiting and waiting. Because we know that he probably already waited until the last minute to get to Jesus. And imagine you're Jairus and you're, well, this is an emergency and your child needs to get to the hospital you call the ambulance and the EMS arrives. You get them into the vehicle and then the drivers spend the next 20 minutes going through Spotify trying to pick out the best playlist for the drive to the hospital. I mean, you'd be more than upset if you were Jairus. There isn't much time. The nerve of Jesus to waste this much time, to waste time on this, this sinner, this low life, this reject, this woman who's not even supposed to be here in the first place. And Jesus goes out of his way to find her and have a conversation. One minute turns into five, maybe turns into 30, who knows? And Jairus has to be fuming, angry. We have to go, he's thinking. Verse 35 says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Heartbreak, right? tragedy. It's, it's despair for Jairus. If Jesus had only been there or just, just had hurried up. But I think Jesus is showing more of who he is in this moment. 
Jesus is showing us truly something amazing about himself. And before we get into that, let's go ahead and let's ruin the rest of the story for you. Because Jesus calls for Jairus to have faith and believe, and they go to the house together, and Jesus raises this 12-year-old daughter from the dead. And as readers, we get to experience two different stories of Jesus pursuing redemption. It's amazing. But in reality, I don't really think this is two different stories. This isn't two separate instances of Jesus doing two separate things. I think this is deliberately one redemption story. Jairus has a 12-year-old daughter that needs new life. And Jesus finds a daughter among the crowd who's been dead for 12 years, the same amount of time that Jairus' daughter has been alive. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years, meaning that for 12 years she has been dead to society, dead to her family, dead to love. And Jesus chooses to give both of these women life. And not only that, he calls both of them child and daughter. He gives them the worthy identity of daughter. You see, it's in this moment that Jesus levels the playing field. On on one hand, we have Jairus with a a well-to-do family that has lots of money, lots of influence, lots of power. It'd be a good idea for Jesus to have someone like Jairus in his corner. And yet on the other hand, you have this person with no influence, with no social standing with no money and Jesus gives both of them the same attention the same love the same miraculous brand new life and what we learn from this singular story of redemption is that there's no one that is too far down that's too far gone that's too worthless that's too broken that's too much of a sinner too much of a rule breaker for the love of Jesus The love of Jesus is all expansive, all encompassing. It reaches out to all of us. And when we kneel down in front of him, we find that the ground is level at the feet of Jesus. Friends, know that you are not too much of anything for the love of Jesus and the worth that he gives you because Jesus finds you worthy of his love no matter what. This woman had been In tragedy, she'd been bleeding for 12 years and she has experienced rejection and loneliness at every turn. But it's even worse than that. I never caught into this before, but it never took the time for it to fully to sink into the depravity of her situation here. Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Not only did she have nobody to lean on, But worse, the very people whose job it was to help her to get well had not only not solved the problem, but it seems like they were likely taking advantage of her. And this woman was at the end of her rope. She had no other options. She had no one else to look towards. She was out of people, out of supporters, out of money, and she was out of options. I don't know... I don't know this morning what you walked into this room with or what you're sitting there at home watching us. I don't know where you find yourself, what what baggage you're hanging on to. But maybe you're finding yourself walking in the same story as this woman. At the very end of yourself, at the very end of your rope and maybe inching closer to rock bottom. Does that resonate at all with you, with the desperation that we see in this woman? Have you tried everything to make your life worth it and found out that you're still wanting because this woman had tried everything she'd done everything paid everything she could and still it didn't give her what she needed until until she finds herself kneeled down in front of Jesus until she comes face to face with Jesus and he meets her in that place not with condemnation not with shame not with anger not with rejection But Jesus meets her, calling her daughter. One of the most beautiful verses in the New Testament. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You see, he chooses to remind her, to reassure her that she is loved like a child. She's loved like a child of God. And in this moment, Jesus strips away the label that's held her down for 12 years. 
And he replaces the label of outcast with the label uh, of included. Jesus replaces her label of unlovable to completely loved. And in the same way, I believe that he wants to remind you of that today. He reminds me that, that you are a child of God, that you are included within his family. And because of that, because of that, you are worthy of his unending, unfailing, always and forever love and redemption. The title and identity of son and daughter means that nothing else matters. Everything else falls to the wayside in comparison to a person's child. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. We go from worthless to worthy when we recognize our identities as sons and daughters in Jesus. We find our redemption when we come face to face with Jesus and we allow him to label us as his child. And with that identifier secure in our hearts, we're found secure in his love. And typically, just like the story of redemption that we read today, we find our identity as sons and daughters and become more secure in that identity when we kneel down in front of Jesus. See, Jairus had no other option. And for the sake of his daughter, he kneels down in front of Jesus. The bleeding woman, she falls down face toward the feet of Jesus as the love of him washes over her. Church, I want to make a suggestion here that maybe it would be wise for us to do the same. So here's what I'm going to ask for you to do this morning. And in the next few minutes, we're going to spend some time, possibly, if you're able, kneeling at the feet of Jesus and pleading for him to remind us of our identities, that we are his children. Sometimes our hearts and minds need reminders from different outside sources. And one of the best and easiest way for us to do this is to posture ourselves in such a way that we remind our hearts and our minds of our place with Jesus. When we kneel down, we remind ourselves of the holiness and worthiness of Jesus. So I'm going to ask this morning if you're capable. Let's, let's do that. If you're able, let's kneel down together in this moment. If you're not able, it's okay. The Gospels are pretty clear to us as it's speaking that Jesus cares more about your heart than your outward appearance. So I'm going to ask for you that you kneel in your hearts and minds if you're not physically capable of doing it. And what we need to do in this moment of kneeling in front of Jesus, I want you to ask some questions. Do I need to be relabeled? Do you need to be restored by Jesus' healing? If, you're, if you find yourself at the end of your rope at rock bottom, ask Jesus to make you well and to start creating a new story of redemption within your own life. Ask him to remind you of your true identity. I'm going to pray, and then I want you to give you some time for you to be one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, with Jesus, kneeling before him. Spend some time with the king this morning. Let's pray. God, as you fill this wonderful space around us with your all-encompassing love, help us to remember that it blots out all of our stains. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me completely, not because of who I am, but in spite of who I am. Thank you for loving this lowly sinner. Help us to remember you are here for everyone, not just the elect. Remind us of the times when you used a broken person, broken people to change the world. I am, we are those broken people. Shape us into the image that will help to change the world around us for your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I'm sure in this time we have a, an elder or two that can come up here and pray with you if you need that as well. I hear the Savior say that I strength indeed is small child of we watch and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as Oh, now indeed I 
and when before the throne I stand in Him complete and Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat because Jesus paid it We have just a few announcements before we leave today. Uh, this Wednesday is our swim night for our youth and children at 7 p.m. at the pool. Let's be there. It'll be a lot of fun. On July 30th, we will be going on our whitewater jet boat trip. Uh, we need you to sign up to go by July 10th. So uh, we know that we have enough people to fill out the boat and sign up at coquillachristian.com slash events. Uh, July 4th, we will also be having our barbecue out at Crane Lake. Come and join us for food, games, and fellowship. For any more information on all events, including how to sign up, please visit us at coquillachristian.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's celebrate our Father's Day and have a great, great rest of our Sunday uh, with our friends and family. Let's go ahead and sing one more song of praise to our Lord. Have a great day.